Well, good morning, friends, and a very warm welcome to you. Psalm 93 declares, The Lord is King. He is clothed with majesty and strength. The earth is set firmly in place and cannot be moved. Your throne, O Lord, has been firm from the beginning, and you existed before time began. So as we prepare our hearts for worship today, let's just focus ourselves upon God. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to worship you together. Thank you for your presence with us. Take any distractions from us and help us to focus ourselves on you as we worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God of heaven living in me, gentle Saviour, closest friend, strong deliverer, beginning and end, all within me falls at your throne, your majesty. Will you join me now in prayer? Let's pray. Eternal and glorious God, we unite our hearts in prayer this morning as we come and bow down to you, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the God of heaven and earth, the God who creates, but also the God who redeems, the God who comes into our world and also comes into our lives. In sovereign power you hold all things in your hands, 
and yet you're also our gentle saviour and our closest friend. You know our sins and our shortcomings, and yet Jesus came and died in our place upon the cross, taking our sins upon himself and clothing us in his righteousness. And so we come to express our praise to you as we lift up your name in worship. Who else deserves our devotion and our worship but you? Who else deserves our love and our obedience but you? You alone have the words of eternal life. And so, Lord, we place our trust in you and find our confidence in the truth of your word. As we make it our aim and our joy to live our lives in fellowship with Jesus, the one who is eternally faithful and true, may our lives declare your glory in all of its beauty and wonder. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our reading today comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4, reading from verses 35 to 41. On the evening of that same day, Jesus said to his disciples, Let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they left the crowd the disciples got into the boat in which Jesus was already sitting, and they took him with them. Other boats were there too. Suddenly, a strong wind blew up, and the waves began to spill over into the boat, so that it was about to fill with water. Jesus was in the back of the boat, sleeping with his head on pillow. The disciples woke him up and said, Teacher, don't you care that we are about to die? Jesus stood up and commanded the wind, Be quiet. And he said to the waves, Be still. The wind died down and there was a great calm. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Why are you frightened? Do you still have no faith? But they were terribly afraid and began to say to one another, Who is this man? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Amen. Have you still no faith? That's a question that could be asked of anyone. 
It was asked of Jesus' disciples by Jesus when they were out and their faith had wavered in the face of a storm. It's a question that requires an answer as much from us as it did from them. I mean, why do you not trust Jesus? Why do you fail to believe in him? Well, let me so suggest some obstacles to faith. Firstly, we want our security to be visible. We trust in things that we can see. The disciples saw the waves, but they didn't trust in Jesus who was asleep in the boat. I've had many conversations with people over the years who couldn't reach a faith because they, they looked at the world around them with all of its misery and its pain and its suffering and the evil that seems to, to dominate so much of life. And they just can't find it within themselves to open themselves up to faith and to belief. Secondly, anything real has to be visible. Think of Thomas when he heard from the other disciples the good news that Jesus had risen, that he was alive, from, that he'd risen from the dead and they had seen him. But Thomas wouldn't believe in that moment. He hadn't seen the risen Jesus with his own eyes. And so for Thomas, the reality was that Jesus had died upon the cross and that death had taken Jesus from them. That's the reality of life. And so Thomas said, unless I see. And so many people stop at the threshold to walk to faith because of that. Thirdly, I think anything relevant has to be visible, doesn't it? That's something that's so predominant today. The, the majority of people around us don't really see why Jesus matters. But isn't the forgiveness of sin to the person whose life and conscience is burdened and weighed down by sin relevant? Isn't the hope of a new life relevant to the person who feels hopeless and helpless? So let's approach the question regarding our story this morning. Why did the disciples have no faith. Again, I think there are three things that we can say about this with a fair amount of confidence. Firstly, they didn't realise the love of Jesus. If they had, then they wouldn't have said that they had failed to trust. Jesus wouldn't have said that they'd failed to trust. And I think that's true of anyone. If we truly realise the great love that Jesus has for us, then we would trust him, surely. Look at what they said to Jesus. Don't you care? I mean, what a question to ask of Jesus, isn't it? Don't you care? The storm was really bad and these seasoned fishermen felt that they were lost and they were afraid. Have you ever felt as though you were going through something, taking on what seemed like to be so much water that you would soon be pulled under? If the answer is yes, then you can identify surely with these disciples and what they were going through. Even though they were in the midst of a storm, a violent storm, in a place uh, in a position in which they had absolutely no control, their deepest fear was that it seemed that Jesus simply didn't care. With all that's taking place, Jesus is sleeping soundly in the back of the boat. And yet, written throughout the Bible, throughout the biblical narrative, and, and really etched into the hearts of every, every believer in Christ, the words come, God cares. God cares. I have loved you with an everlasting love, God says to his people. Jesus himself said, for God so loved the world. And one of my favourite Bible verses I've said before is this. 
This is what love is. It's not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the means by which our sins are forgiven. Let me mention just a few examples of, of this care of Jesus. Jesus had to go through Samaria, you'll remember, because he cared for the woman he met at the, wheel, at the, at the well who received forgiveness and love and grace from Jesus. Jesus set aside his reputation as he sat beside and ate with tax collectors and sinners. Why? Because he cared. Jesus went to Bethany and put his own life at risk when his friend Lazarus had died and Lazarus' sisters, who were also friends of Jesus, had sent word to Jesus. Jesus put his own life at risk to go there at that time. Why? Because he cares. God says, Can a woman forget her own baby and not love the child she bore? Even if a mother should forget her child, I will never forget you. And when Jesus weeps over a city, over Jerusalem itself, he weeps with the eternal love of God within his heart. And yes, there's still Calvary, isn't there? Still Calvary. Even with everything already mentioned, and we could have given so many more examples, there stands the cross. It stands above every other sign of God's love for us. And it declares that Jesus, the Son of God, loved me and gave his life for me and for you. God cares. Jesus cares. No one who truly sees the meaning of the cross could ever say that Jesus doesn't care or can ever ask, Lord, don't you care? Secondly, I think they failed to trust in the power of Jesus, didn't they? When the disciples wake up and they call out, Teacher, don't you care that we are about to die? Jesus stood up and he commanded the wind, Be quiet. And he said to the waves, Be still. And the wind died down and there was a great calm. Imagine that, if you will. There was a great calm calm. The one who creates the wind controls the storm with a word. The power of Jesus is that great. Jesus' answer to the disciples' questions and their fear and their distress is to get up and as some versions put it, he rebuked the wind, rebuked the wind and said to the waves, peace be still. You see, Jesus isn't, and his care, isn't some imaginary kind of hope or some fluffy sentimental crutch. Jesus' care is active and it's powerful. Jesus cares. He cares enough to be in the boat with his disciples. He cares enough to be Emmanuel, God with us, with his disciples. He cares enough to be human with us and to lay down his life to save us from ourselves. There was power in his words, there was power in his teaching. The power of Jesus' teaching, you know, it was more than just his freshness and his vision. His words had authority and power. Jesus said, didn't he, I'm telling you the truth, that those who hear my words and believe in him who sent me have eternal life. They will not be judged, but have already passed from death to life. I'm telling you the truth, the time is coming, the time has already come, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear it will come to life. And as a kind of foreshadowing of that great promise uh, when Jesus stood at the grave of his friend Lazarus and he cried out, Lazarus, come out. That's exactly what happened. Lazarus came out of the tomb 
alive. And here in the boat with the disciples is the one whose word has that kind of authority, that kind of power. Finally, they didn't understand who Jesus is. They hadn't quite gotten to that point. They hadn't reached that level of understanding yet. Jesus asked his disciples, Why are you frightened? Do you still have no faith? But they were terribly afraid and began to say to one another, Who is this man? Even the wind and waves obey him. Who is this man? You know, truth be told, I think that we would have all been frightened. Any one of us would have been frightened if we had been in that boat on that day. But Jesus doesn't ask them the question because they are frightened. I think he understands fear. I don't think there's a problem with that. I think he asks this question because of the way that they were asking for help, the way they were asking for his intervention. See, if they had confidence in Jesus and in his power to help, and had come and had slightly more calmly wakened him and said, Lord, you know, we really need your help here, expecting him to help, then that would have been far better than this teacher, don't you care that we're about to die or drown or whatever. See, Jesus had already begun to show in his life that he is the Son of God and that he has authority and power. And he'd been teaching about the kingdom of God and about what the kingdom is like. But they hadn't quite grasped that yet. If you look back uh, earlier in Mark's Gospel, you see that there had already been many healing min- miracles, healing miracles in which Jesus' divinity had been revealed. Probably the, the, the best known one of these is the most prominent one in Mark 2, when four friends brought their paralyzed friend, uh, along on his bed, along his mat, before Jesus. And they saw the miracle of Jesus healing this man and of him being able to walk again. And they knew that that had taken place because Jesus had forgiven the man his sins. And yet they still didn't yet believe what they had seen and heard. And so they were still asking, this kind of question about him. Who is this man? Who is this? Well, let me finish with this quote that I picked up from a commentary that I read. It seems so ridiculous when it's all over and Jesus has rebuked the angry waves. But we must learn to trust all the time because at the heart of the storm is Jesus. Think of him, utterly detached from circumstances, altogether at peace. For you see, he was not really lying on hard boards in a storm-tossed boat. He was in the arms of the everlasting Father. And that makes all the difference in the world. The disciples too were in the arms of the everlasting Father. They just hadn't realised it yet. God bless you in your life with Jesus.
Jesus said, Why are you frightened? Have you still no faith? Let's pray. Lord, it seems that the disciples in the lead up to the storm have been hearing Jesus teaching about the workings of the kingdom of God through stories and parables. By the evening of the particular day we've been studying, they move from listening to the stories to suddenly becoming an actual part of the story, thrust into the gritty reality of a storm and genuinely feeling that their lives are at risk. We often find that the theory of our faith is something we can mull over, try to make sense of and tackle with our minds. Remind us, if we need reminding, that theory without practice is somewhat diminished and that we must endeavour to practice what we know with awareness in the ordinariness of everyday life. Jesus said, Why are you frightened? Have you still no faith? Jesus, when you asked these questions of the disciples, were you angry with them? Exasperated or disappointed? Were they rhetorical questions to which you didn't expect answers? Were your questions thrust out to challenge or to provoke a response in that moment or sometime in the future? to make them think or to connect belief with practice or belief with total trust in you. We don't know, but perhaps our own response to this may uncover something about ourselves which we need to think about a little more. So now we pause and think about that in a little more detail. Jesus said, Why are you frightened? Have you still no faith? We pray for Christians throughout the world who are persecuted for their faith in you, those who are jailed, those treated badly by the society in which they live, those for whom every day is a real struggle with no obvious hope for change in the near future. Enable them through your power and their relationship and prayer with you to maintain their dignity, to rejoice in your love of them as they can and to persevere faithfully knowing that we and other Christians throughout the world are praying for them. Enable us too in our future prayer groups to begin praying more specifically and usefully for Christians in such situations. We pray too for fellow Christians struggling with doubt, desperately holding on to slim vestiges of faith, perhaps feeling guilty or isolated, not feeling that the church should be ready or want to hear how desperately they are struggling. We pray for people who would like to believe in something or who experience an emptiness within, who don't know where or how to start or who may be nervous about the effect it may have on their life and relationships. You have called us to be salt and light, to be your presence in everyday life, along with the help of your Holy Spirit. Make us aware and willing to say something or do something in which they may see your love streaming through. We know for a fact that there are some around us who have given up on faith or on the church for all different reasons. Make us ready to help rekindle any living embers of faith they still have within by listening to them, inviting them, sharing our own faith experience with them as simply and as honestly as we can, knowing that you will bless us in our endeavours, however simple or how messy they may be. Lord Jesus, may your questions continue to resound in the thinking and outplaying of our faith in the coming weeks. Why are you frightened? Have you still no faith? These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
My hope is built on nothing less Than Jesus' blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame But wholly trust in Jesus' name My hope is built on nothing less Than Jesus' blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame But wholly trust in Jesus' name Christ alone, cornerstone Weak made strong in the Savior's love Through the storm When darkness seems to hide his face I rest on his unchanging grace In every high and stormy gale My anchor holds within the veil My anchor holds within the veil Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. He is Lord. When he shall come with trumpet sound Oh, may I then in him be found Dressed in his righteousness alone Faultless stand before the throne Christ alone Well, thank you for joining with us again today. And as you journey through the rest of this day and indeed the week ahead, go with this blessing. Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favour rests. May his life and light shine upon you today and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>